Now I wish to introduce Professor Kannan. Professor Kannan is a very popular name in Bangalore in the intellectual circle. Professor Kannan, he was a SRS JM Chair Professor in IIT Madras till recently. Now he is back to Bangalore. And Professor Kannan is a renowned Sanskrit scholar. He has served as the academic director of Swadeshi Indology series, conference series organized by Infinity Foundation India and as the director of Karnataka Sanskrit University, Bangalore. And he is a teacher for many, many students as well as present scholars. Therefore, we have to say Maha Mahopadhyaya and thank you Allah. And Many recognitions have come in search of him. That is, conferred honorary delete by Rashtriya Samskota Vidyapita Tirupati, the title of Vidyanidhi by Sri Rangapriya Swamiji Bangalore, the International Merit Award for a paper on merit, uh, mission translation. He has more than 30 books to his credit and uh, number of papers published in various journals, which span various sub this thing like uh, Vyakarana, Kavya, Ayurveda and philosophy. Now, I request Professor Kandan to deliver the valedictory address. Rupam yattat prahur vyakta madhyam brahma jyotihi nirgunam nirvikaram satta matram nirvishesham neriham sattvam sakshat vishnaradhyatmadipaha <coughs> I am extremely thankful to the organizers of <coughs> um, Mythic Society and IGNCA for providing me an opportunity to speak a few words on Anand Kumar Swami. <coughs> I was assigned the topic of uh, uh, truth in life, truth in beauty, the unifying vision of uh, Anand Kumar Swami. <coughs> um, the topic is rather abstract. <coughs> Uh, I do not know why I was um, cho chosen to give lecture on this topic, <coughs> but uh, I hope I will be able to do some justice to uh, this topic. <coughs> I have given a, a number of uh, lectures on the Kumar Swami, so maybe some 15 lectures in different places in national and international conferences. I gave a series of five lectures in Gokul Institute of Public Affairs, um, a, a series of five lectures, and in the initial world culture, I gave two lectures on Anand Kumar Swami under the auspices of IGNC itself and um, <coughs> um, uh, way back, um, I think it was in uh, 1984, I gave my first talk on Anand Kumar Swami at the Indian Show World Culture and in 1993 I gave a talk on Anand Kumar Swami at Rashtrathana Parishad. So I have given a, a number of uh, lectures in, in the Hyderabad conference also I gave one lecture and so on. <coughs> Understanding Kumar Swami is not very easy. <coughs> Misunderstanding him is quite easy. So, uh, a, a, any person who does not have a sound knowledge of English and Sanskrit, at least, cannot easily venture into the writings of Kumar Swami. Of course, a knowledge of um, Pali and Greek and Latin would be a bonus, but uh, at least these two, uh, one must be thoroughly acquainted with, especially when, if one has to delve into his later writings. So. Um, his career is, um, see, uh, he began with the collection of arts and studying um, uh, the local arts in Ceylon where he was worried that the local arts are dying and therefore he started the Society for the Protection of Local Arts and from there on um, the, the study naturally drew him into the meaning of art. So he began to study the philosophy behind the art and then he became a, a great metaphysician. Physician. So, uh, he had uh, a rich collection of uh, Indian arts and artifacts, but unfortunately he was denied a place in uh, Banaras Hindu University where he wanted to donate uh, all his collections and become the curator there. Uh, the loss of India was a gain to America and uh, uh, Ross there gave him a chance to uh, become the curator of the museum there. So I don't want to go into the details there, uh, that has already been covered uh, yesterday in the lecture by Dr. Laura. Uh, 
<coughs> um, I'll be touching on four themes. So um, I have been told that I must finish in about um, 30 or 45 minutes and I'll try to be as brief as possible. Uh, naturally, one cannot do justice to an abstract theme in such a small span of time. <coughs> the definitions of uh, beauty and truth as given by Kumar Swami, the role of uh, the artist in this uh, faculty and function, and the pursuit of truth and beauty, and the personification of truth and beauty. These are the four topics on which I am going to um, briefly speak. <coughs> We are all familiar with um, commonplace statements uh, regarding beauty as beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So, um, which is to say that it is uh, somewhat personal and there is not much objective about it. And David Hume gave a, a better touch to it saying beauty in things exists in the mind which contemplates them. So, <coughs> um, raising the level from the eye to the, the mind and then there is this statement of uh, Keats which is very well known, beauty is truth, in truth, beauty, there is all ye know on earth and um, all ye need to know, <coughs> though this was um, criticized by T.S. Eliot. Now, in Sanskrit also there are a number of statements um, uh, which are uh, certain kindred ideas. So, Keats says elsewhere, the thing of beauty is a joy forever, its loveliness increases, it will never pass into nothingness. And um, quite comparable is the definition given by Magha in Sishupalavadha who says, Kshane Kshane Yan Navatam Upaiti Tadeva Rupam Ramaniyatayaha. So, what looks anew every moment? So, that is indeed the form of beauty. And we have the statement um, of Bhasa who says, Sarvashobhaniyam Surupam Nama. So, good beauty is looks fine in all circumstances which is itself uh, improved upon by Kalidasa who says Kimivahi Mudharana Mandanam Nakritina what does not um, provide see, uh, uh, grandeur to what is naturally beautiful and uh, we find many statements so for example in Brichakatika also we have the statement Nahya Kritihi Susadrisham Vijahati Vrittam so what is truly beautiful will never shed its uh, true state of beauty and so on of truth, there is one beautiful definition in the Mahabharata which says, Yad bhuta hitam atyantam yetat satyam matam mama. So, generally, we consider truth as being true to fact, but the Mahabharata says that one must also consider what is indeed conducive to the welfare of a person, and that alone can be the truth. Uh, Kumar Swami uh, refers to the concepts of beauty and truth at their uh, pristine levels. So, for which he takes um, the reference from Shukranitisara. So, we had some comments about Shukranitisara being a, an inauthentic work and so on. Now, that debate was generated because of uh, the first edition of uh, Shukranitisara by Gustav Appar, so who had a very great admiration for India and Indian heritage. And uh, uh, he wrote a paper saying that the 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 first formula for gunpowder was provided in India in Shukranitisara. And the claim to that credit was uh, generally taken by the Chinese and therefore naturally people who were uh, not uh, say appreciative of um, Indian glories, they began to write um, articles against the same and they said that Shukranitisara is not an authentic text. And or at least that such portions as deal with gunpowder must have been later interpolations and so on. So it is because of these uh, political issues that the work was um, um, branded as dubious. But on the other hand, it is a work not only dealing with um, Arthashastra, see, see, it is Shukranitasara deals with Arthashastra, but also deals with, for example, 64 Kalas it deals with. Therefore, it naturally has a say on uh, uh, what is true art. And he provides a definition of beauty there. He says, Shastra manena yo ramyaha saramyaha nanya evahi. So, um, what is beautiful as per the Shastric standards, in fact, Kumar Swami, uh, an expert in etymology, shows that uh, what is normal is what conforms to norms. So, that is the beautiful analysis that is given by uh, Kumar Swami. And this uh, statement by Shukranitisara also states the same thing. Shastramana vihinam yati 
aramyam tad vipaschitam so what does not conform to the shastra is not to be considered as ramaniya ekeshame vatadramyam lagnam yatra cha yasya hrti so what others uh, uh, the the ordinary the lay declare as beautiful is something that just appeals to them and is not something that conforms to shastrik norms and the text also says that the artist who um, makes a sculpture of a divinity even if it is not sulakshana it is more honorable than one that that is um, done for example for a human being even if it is sulakshana so api shreyaskaram dhrunam deva bimbam alakshanam salakshanam marte bimbam nahi shreyaskaram tada and therefore the the theme that artists pursue is also something to be uh, taken into account of um, um truth we have the famous uh, statements satya me vajayate in the upanishads and uh, uh, such statements show some aspects of truth but the true definition of truth is for example in taitri upanishad we have satyam gyanam anantam brahma or in the aitreya and maitraya in upanishads uh, presented as satyasya satyam rata satya yonim etc so uh, unfortunately because of lack of time i'm not going to the explications are the same but on the kumar swami time and again shows that the names of truth and beauty are given to the the lord in almost every tradition and in the bhagavata we have the uh, very definition of beauty as it were as applicable to lord krishna so afum it is said tadeva ramyam ruchiram navam navam so uh, that alone is ramya and ruchira and navam navam so ever fresh tadeva shashvat manaso mahotsavam it is also something that is a great festivity for the mind tadeva shokarnam shoshanam dranam id id uttam shloka yesho anugiyate so where the theme is pertaining to a, a great personage it is such themes that elevate the mind so it's not merely something that should um, make us very happy by looking at the charm of the picture but it is also something that um elevates us regarding rama in the ramayana we have the expressions rupo rupa udarya gunaif pumsam drishti chitta apaharinam so the rupa of rama is drishti apahari and the udarya guna is chitta apahari and therefore both his appearance and his character and conduct were something things that appeal to the mind and the heart of people and it is said that when rama entered the forest in the aranyakanda the sages themselves were wonderstruck at the extraordinary beauty of the handsomeness of uh, rama so rupa samhananam lakshmim saukumaryam suveshatam dadrushur vismita akaraha ramasya vanavasinah in another upanishad it is said that it is those very sages who were captivated by the handsome person of uh, la rama so they prayed for their um, birth so once more so that they have a, a close embrace of um, the lord and it is said that it is they who are born as the gopis now the combination of the true the good and the beautiful is generally ascribed to victor cousin so a, a french writer of um, um, 19th century so du bray du bu et du bien so is the uh, expression that is uh, framed by him and it is said that uh, indians derived the concepts of satyam shivam sundaram from this uh, writing of the french author victor cousin but however it has been found that um, uh, one work uh, which uh, which is uh, in praise of um, goswami tulasi dasa so the work is called moola goswami charita so written in abhramsha has the expression satyam shivam sundaram so uh, naturally in that language shiva becomes shiva and this we will find that even prior to the uh, western presentation of the idea of the combination or the unity of the three concepts of the true the good and the beautiful we find it already there in one of our own texts it is even been said that the unity of uh, these three is first found in the greek sources but then uh, in the vedic sources themselves we find the three juxtaposed in the in the famous rigvedic mantra we have vishwani deva savidur dulitani parasuva yad bhadram tanna asuva so in that verse we have the word bhadram and then 
the next verse has Vama and then the other next verse has the word Satya. So in all these we find that uh, in the three consecutive verses the concept of Satya, Shiva and Sundara, the, the true, the, the auspicious and the beautiful have been juxtaposed. Um, uh, in his uh, excellent work, Figures of Speech or Figures of Thought, Anandu Kumar Swami um, deals with a number of aspects of um, um, beauty and there he says that uh, beauty is not something that appeals to the mere senses and if beauty is to be judged as something that appeals to the mere sense organs then, in, then human beings are in no way different from animals. So what is shared with animals is uh, rather the very, very nominal one but what is intelligible is the one thing that makes the thing superior and therefore the uh, aspect of in, in intellect there, the intellectual operation in Indian art itself is one article of um, Kumar Swami and the involvement of uh, contemplation and action, so jnana and karma in the production of any work of art is uh, very beautifully shown there. <coughs> And Kumar Swami quotes with approval the words of St. Thomas Aquinas who says, Beauty pertains to the cognitive, not the appetitive faculty. The appetitive faculty are our sense organs, our indriyas. So if something is merely pleasing to the eye, that does not necessarily mean that it is beautiful. But on the other hand, what is the content, what is the message, one has to look into that also. And uh, in this we can find an easy concordance in the, in the famous work of um, Kalidasa who says uh, regarding the art of the stage, regarding Natya, he says Devanam idam amananti munayaha kantam kratum chakshusham rudre neda umakrata vidikare swange vibhaktam dvidha treigunyodha matra loka jaritam nanarasam drishyate natyam bhinnarucher janasya bodha pekam samaradhanam so in that verse he says, Devanam idam amananti munayaha kantam kratum chakshusham. Even the art of the stage is as it were a sacrifice. So it is a chakshusha kratu. So it is a sacrifice for the eye. So whereas the, the real sacrifice involves uh, a lot of difficulties. This is something that one can just sit in his chair and watch and enjoy. And therefore this is called... Uh, See, chakshusha, kratu, kratu means yajna and chakshusha means what can be enjoyed by the eyes and therefore um, even the art of the stage and the various arts are all considered ways of not merely entertainment but also one's ennoblement. So, and um, Kumar Swami brings in the works of Plato here showing the responsibility of the artist and that is in fact a very good message to a good many of the artists of today who have deviated from what they ought to be and what they ought not to be. So this is not to say that uh, the freedom of expression is curtailed, but on the other hand, in what sense and in what limits the freedom of uh, expression is to be pursued. So um, he says, if he represents what ought to be, what not to be, what ought not to be represented, and brings into being things unworthy of free men. Such artists should be punished or at the least restrained or exiled like any other criminal or madman. You know, a, a good many of the workings of, of the present day artists, so which shows a high sense of responsibility, uh, shows this. So, uh, Plato, without respect for their abilities, however great, would banish from society of rational men lest from imitation of shameful things men should imbibe their actuality. And Kumar Swami gives this example, that is to say, for the same reason that we, in moments of sanity, see it fit to condemn the exhibition of gangster films. So, yesterday was somebody was saying that uh, Kumar Swami does not refer to the films, he says, um, exhibition of gangster films in which the villain is made a hero. You know, see, most of our productions today or ones in which villains are made heroes. So, or agree to forbid the manufacture of even the most skillfully adulterated food. Now, would you like to consume food which is adulterated with great skill? So, we have uh, wonderful machines with, see, which produce plastic particle, particles just resembling our grace of rain, uh, uh, the, the grain of rice. So, uh, would you consume such a food? 
in other words howsoever the skill be of the person who produces a piece of work so if that is does not conduce to the welfare of the individual then just such things must be eschewed and that is where kumar swami introduces <coughs> our pursuing uh, patterns which are commendable and he shows how he quotes from aitareya brahmana and says iyam daivi veena tadanu krisita sau manushi veena how this um, the, the veena um, uh, musical instrument is modeled after the divine veena so this comes somewhat closer to the plato's ideas of uh, ideals so ideas so <coughs> but in our country this has been pursued in a more concrete manner in fact the the, the our own brain and the spinal cord form an excellent model for the veena and that is called that's why it's called daivi veena and it is at that model that the 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 musical instrument that device which is called manushi veena is modeled and um real beauty is grasped not merely with the external eyes but on the other hand uh, more responsibly when a person is able to turn inward so avrutta chakshus so this is an expression from uh, kathopanishad in kathopanishad we have the um, expression avrutta chakshuhu amrutatvam ichhan so paranchikhanu vitranat swayam bhuhu tasmat paran pashyati antaratman kaschid dhira pratyagatmanam ekshad avrutta chakshuhu amrutatvam ichhan so it is as though we are all, we all have a natural tendency to look outward to outwards so all our sense organs are directed outwards and we can't gather any any information so uh, what is happening within us and it is only when a person is able to turn his gaze inwards so uh, it is then that a person can so it's called jnana chakshus and tapas chakshus chakshus etc whereas our physical eyes are called mamsa chakshus so uh, it is the, when the inner eye is open that the true beauty is revealed and uh, kumar swami also provides the model of the sacrifice so where he says if the sacrificer is um, confused or at doubt then there is the instruction in sacrificial texts cheta yadham you contemplate look within and then you will know what the next step is kumar swami takes the expression man does not <coughs> live by bread alone so and he says what we acquire <clears throat> through our sense organs is something that is parallel in the animal kingdom and to be human is certainly to be much more and kumar swami shows here that um, the modern anthropologists for example are uh, very spiteful while they depict the um, tribal um, cultures and so on so but even in primitive societies there is there are certain norms of life and as another um, um, uh, anthropologist himself by name schmidt has pointed out so the needs of the body and the soul are satisfied together this is a formula that keeps recurring in anand kumar swami's writings the needs of the body and the soul are satisfied together so if it is something that we eat that is very tasty but not good for our, our health then it is to be eschewed on the other hand it is something that is good both for our health and is also tasty it is such food that needs to be enjoyed and therefore the needs of the body it is not that spirituality is something totally distinct and separate and worldly life is totally different from that the two cannot be compartmentalized and one alienated from the other on the other hand it is a constant pursuit a combination of the two that has to be one's way of life now how we use our faculties so is uh, very well illustrated by kumar swami as a model to uh, show how we ought to lead our life so he is uh, refers to the the voice or the walk so um, in communication of truth so we employ the faculty of speech either if we do so that is either to convey untruth or convey in an ununderstandable way our speech is failing us and if our expression is also charming by virtue of conforming to what good speech should be it's even better he calls it splendor veritatis so beauty is the the face of truth the appearance of truth now um kumar swami gives a uh, beautiful analogy of the vadya and the vadaka the instrument and the the person who plays on the instrument so the player and the instrument are both essential 
we in our semantic individuality are the instrument of which the strings or senses are to be regulated so as to be neither slack nor overstrained. So there must be a certain discipline in our life so that we are neither too slack nor uh, too overly disciplined. We are the organ, the inorganic God within us, the organist. We are the organism, he, its energy. It's not for us to play our own tunes but to sing his songs. So, who is both the person in the sun and our own person, so um, as distinguished from our personality. So, <coughs> uh, he, he shows that the word uh, personality has very negative uh, uh, descriptions and origins in the uh, modern usage. I will not go into the details. Now, <coughs> the, the word Brahman and the Sahodara regarding which some discussion was also made in, in, in the morning. One must know that this was an expression coined by Vishwanatha in his Sahitya Darpana. And prior to that, Kavya Prakasha of Mamata also uses a similar expression, Vigalita Vedyantaram, Anandam, so, uh, and so on. So, <coughs> and so, subsequent to that, you can see that nowhere, uh, not a single Alankarika has contradicted this, which is to say, so including Jagannatha, the, one of the latest Alankarikas, he says, Bhagna Varana Chideva Rasaha. So, giving a definition of rasa, he says that the chit itself, when all its um, see, enclosures and envelopes are uh, removed, then that itself is rasa. So that is the kind of definition that uh, Jagannath gives. Now, uh, there has been not a single contradiction in the entire history of Alankara Shastra, so regarding this concept of Brahmananda Sahodara, where, so we see that the Kavya Rasa Swada is something that bears kinship with Brahmananda. And <coughs> Abhinav Gupta himself says all other types of Ananda are Vipul Matra or but small fractions and fragments of Brahmananda. So if for example a scientist is deeply involved in his work and is you see, totally oblivious to his circumstances, then he too is getting close to that Ananda. In fact Upanishads go, go on to say that even in the Sopna, in the Sushupta Avastha, so when all the external organs are closed, so they have a natural closure, even then one is closer to Brahman, but well, it's only on account of the predominance of tamas that one is not able to taste Brahman as such, but these are all uh, situations where one withdraws from the exterior and therefore traverses inwards and it is in that sense that um, uh, the, the texts that, that convey some of the greatest values of life and are also uh, see, most absorbing. So they are to be considered as uh, the relish of such texts are to be considered Brahmananda. And um, while saying this, so he, he, he refers to the, the person in the sun and the our own person, so which is which bears kinship to the Upanishadic statements, Ishta Savayam Purushaha, Aditya Ishta so Mayi Isa Ekaha. So the, such expressions are very clearly there. And Kumar Swami uh, brings out this Vadya Vadaka analogy, so and takes it, in fact, uh, draws it close to Chandogya Upanishad, where uh, the same idea is given that the person who pursues the, the, the spiritual path, combining it with the worldly life, gains both worlds. So, the expressions in Chandogya Upanishad, which I cannot <coughs> explain, I don't have time, it says, Sayesha Echa. Uh, so, sani is to acquire. So, one acquires worldly riches too. So, there is also the statement of Yasa. He would say, Urdhu bahur virav meshaha nachaka shichanoti me dharma darthascha kamascha. So, he says, I, I shout, I cry hoarse with raised hands. So, but nobody listens to me. The pursuit of dharma also brings in dharma and kama as byproducts. So, this shloka also says, the Upanishad also says the same thing. Athaya eta devam vidwan sama gayati ubhau sagayati so munaiva sa esha echash amushmat parancha loka ha tamscha apnoti deva kamamscha. So, the, the great lokas and the deva kamas are both obtained. Uh, by this pursuit, the concept of uh, Vamani and Bhamani in Chandogya Upanishad, so they can be noted here. So this uh, shows the Sadhaka's way and the other portion, the remaining portion that I uh, show is the Siddha's way, so the way of uh, Nataraja. So we have also, we have all heard the, the famous verse, 
నృత్తావసానే నటరాజరాజహా నాత ఢక్కా నవ పంచవారం ఉద్ధర్తు కాము సనకాతి సిద్ధాన్ని తద్ విమర్శేశ సూత్రజాలం సో లార్డ్ శివ పర్ఫార్మ్ దిస్ డాన్స్ సో ఆనంద్ కుమార్ స్వామి హ్యాస్ కోర్ట్ ది నేమ్ ఆఫ్ ది బుక్ ఇట్స్ సెల్ఫ్ ఇస్ డాన్స్ ఆఫ్ శివ అండ్ వి నో దిట్ ఫ్రమ్ దిస్ వర్స్ హీ వెన్ నటరాజా సౌండెడ్ హిస్ డ్రమ్ సో ఇట్ ఇస్ ఎట్ దట్ ఫోర్టీన్ సూత్రాస్ ఎమినేటెడ్ ఫ్రమ్ దట్ ఐ ఓన్ రిల్ ఏ ఓన్ ఐ ఔ విచ్ ఎట్సెట్రా విచ్ ఆర్ స్టడీడ్ ఇన్ ది ప్రైమరీ స్కూల్ ఇన్ గ్రామర్ అండ్ కుమార్ స్వామి హ్యాస్ ఫోర్టీన్ ఎస్ఏస్ ఫోర్టీన్ ఇండియన్ ఎస్ఏస్ యు సీ ఇన్ దట్ బుక్ డాన్స్ ఆఫ్ శివ అండ్ డాన్స్ ఆఫ్ శివ ఈజ్ నేమ్ వన్ చాప్టర్ దే అండ్ హీ బ్రింగ్స్ అవుట్ ది బ్యూటీ ఆఫ్ ది డాన్స్ ఆఫ్ శివ హౌ ది హయ్యెస్ట్ ట్రూత్ షోస్ ఇట్ సెల్ఫ్ హ్యాస్ ది గ్రేటెస్ట్ బ్యూటీ అండ్ Uh, actually when uh, anand kumar swami wrote that work it was in 1918 he was uh, barely 40 so at that age he wrote this uh, marvelous work and you can see that more or less to even to the end of his life there was nothing that is written by kumar swami that would that could contradict any of the items here except one thing namely that um, during that period so uh, the aryan dravidian theory was so much in vogue and Kumar Swami also referred to Lord Shiva as a pre-Aryan hill god. And even in this um, uh, uh, book of 1926, History of Indian and Indonesian Art, uh, he still dwells on the theme of Aryans and Dravidians, but by uh, the time of 1935, so he, he has a strong suspicion that this is a baseless theory. And therefore in his book called Rigveda as Land Norma Book, so he suspects that uh, he is very skeptical about the assertion of um, uh, this kind of thinking of um, see lord shiva being a hill god and so on so and uh, uh, kumar swami gives a very beautiful description of the dancing shiva um, in fact those of you can uh, afford to get the book it's available in many libraries including mythic library mythic society and it's easily available today on archive.org so anybody can get easy access to the book so it's just a 15 page article one must definitely read to see the description of shiva there in the dancing mode um, but for my lack of time i will not go into that and regarding the interpretation of that kumar swami says even without reliance upon literary references the interpretation of this dance would not be difficult fortunately however we have the assistance of copious contemporary literature so it is not the case that kumar swami is imposing some, some of uh, his own ideas as explaining the symbols there but even in the current times when the piece of art the chola art 7th and 8th century ad so even those times the the symbolism was very clearly understood and that he um, brings out so very well he says <coughs> there are how many various dances of shiva are known to his worshippers i cannot say there are numerous dances of shiva but he says uh, coursing through them all is the one root idea namely the manifestation of the primal rhythmic energy and he says i'll say it only three to explain namely the pradoshan artana um, and then the bhairava tandava and nadanta natana so in last one at chidambaram and it is on that that he focuses now in the pradosha tandava so it is celebrated in the mahakala temple in ujjaini also even to this day so kalidasa himself refers to the uh, sandhya tandava in ujjaini so the at the mahakala temple there and uh, the kumar swami gives in translation of the uh, shiva pradosha stotra so the pradosha stotra is in uh, is in sanskrit and then the uh, bhairava tandava Uh, he translates from a uh, bengali source and the nadanta natana chidambaram he translates from tamil sources and therefore this is a pan indian theme and phenomenon and there is a concurrence all through the country regarding the symbolism of uh, this piece of art so uh, this is a divine uh, chorus that we have so kailasa shaila bhavane trijagajjinitri gauri nivesya kanakanchita ratnapeethe nrityam vidhatu vivanchita shula pano devam deva pradosha samaye nu bhajanti sarve ours is a gallant lord so he has made sit parvati in a chair in a simhasana and in front of parvati shiva is performing the dance here so gauri nivesya so nrityam vidhatu vivanchita shula pano all the gods have assembled and they also joined the chorus 
so uh, how is the um, performance so all the gods are participants in this dance program vag devi dhrita vallaki saraswati is holding the the veena shatamakho venum dadhati indra is playing on the flute padmajah talo nidrakara brahma is playing the taala and rama bhagavati geya prayoganvita so, so lakshmi herself is singing and vishnu sandra mrudanga vadana patu vishnu is playing on the mrudanga deva samanta sthita all the gods and divinities are assembled all around devante tamana pradosha samaye devam nadani patim so and uh, the various demigods are also there gandharva yaksha patagora gasiddha sadhya vidyadhara amara apsarasam ganascha yenye triloka nilaya sahabhuta varga ha prapte pradosha samaye hara parsha samstha they have all assembled to see the la the lord of dance is called nataraja or nataraja raja so he is dancing and they are all loud to witness that uh, uh, the dance so kumar swami uh, brings out in the bengali source into english where kali's dance is described on similar lines and in chidam in tamil texts like chidambaram mumunikovai and then tirumantram unmai vilakkam and shiva uh, shivajnana siddhiyar etc the the dance of chidambaram is most beautifully described so the the three citations said this indeed represented so it is a it's a pan indian understanding so it's not a question of somebody imposing one sort interpretation or imposing fanciful interpretations and so on now uh, kumar swami points out that essential significance so he has been dealing with essential kumar swami here he is uh, speaking of the essential significance of dance of shiva and as three things so one is the play and that is the purpose and this is the place so it is a rhythmic play at the source of all movement within the cosmos which is represented by the arch the, thri- the thiruvasi is something that shows the the prakriti and the range of the phenomenon of movement of um, prakriti is shown there and then the purpose of the dance is to release the countless souls of men from the snare of illusion so <clears throat> it is not a, a mere fancy dance but it is done with a great purpose namely the uddhara of the various souls and the place of dance so even in darshan upanishad not merely the tamil sources that is but even in the upanishads it is very clearly recognized that hridambaram tu chin madhyam so the chidambara is the center of the heart now in this course so me explicates how this image is a wonderful synthesis of science religion and art mark my words so it's a wonderful synthesis of science religion and art now his own exclamation is worth noticing how amazing the range of thought and sympathy of those rishi artists who first conceived such a type as this affording an aim image of reality a key to the complex tissue of life a theory of nature not merely satisfactory to a single clique or race nor acceptable to the thinkers of one century only but universal in its appeal to the philosopher the lover and the artist of all ages and all countries so such universal see theme that the dance represents how supremely great in power and grace this dancing image must appear to all those who have striven in plastic forms to give expression to their intuition of life so kumar swami himself waxes eloquent in praise of the great dance i'll conclude by just referring to to two small items one thing is the kind of reactions indian art evoked before kumar swami appeared on the scene there is for example the statement of vincent smith who says indian sculpture properly so called hardly deserves to be reckoned as art he says there is nothing like art indian art so indians have no sense of art that is the idea that they have the figures of both men and animals become stiff and formal and the idea of power is clumsily expressed by the multiplication of members he thinks vincent smith thinks that if uh, vishnu or shiva is shown with see chaturbhuja or ashtabhuja or whatever then it's the it is the idea of power clumsily expressed the many headed many armed gods and goddesses whose images crowd the walls and roofs of medieval temples have no pretensions to beauty and are frequently hideous and grotesque so this is this is kind of uh, see declamation that the uh, westerners produced sir george birdwood was himself sympathetic to its uh, indian causes and in, in many respects but he himself considered that the monstrous shapes of the puranic deities are unsuitable for higher forms of artistic representation 
So India has nothing to do with art. They have no sense of art. Is this is what they have been telling, and this is possibly why sculpture and painting are unknown as fine arts in India. These are the kinds of verdicts that used to be passed regarding Indian art. Alfred Maskell said, "These hideous deities with animals' heads and innumerable arms." If you go to the elephant caves, you will, you will be shown a number of murtis there, which are used as see uh, shooting targets by those scoundrels, so the foreigners who had come and settled in India. So they had absolutely no respect. It is now that the value of Indian music is being recognized. It is now that the value of see Indian logic is being recognized. Now <coughs> you have the most highly developed mathematical representation of Navinaya. So Navinaya expressions. So uh, it is professors of mathematics who are discussing issues of Navinaya and the ways of presentation of uh, Navinaya. Already Ingalls had recognized that uh, De Morgan's theorem was influenced by the Navinaya's double negation system. So <clears throat> and today we have advanced mathematicians dealing with that. So even Vedic mathematics is being today dealt with uh, uh, advanced mathematics uh, scholars. So uh, who are pursuing these and the the best of uh, engineers today so have been able to arrive at no theory better than pony's karaka theory when it comes to language processing so this we find that it was a common feature because of the utter and i should say rabid eurocentrism so where they would not give credit to anything good and great in india so for example in the history of mathematics 500 years before the west indians had discovered the heliocentric theory so Uh, or the Fibonacci theorem. So much before the Fibonacci had done it, the Virahanka, uh, a Jain scholar, had uh, worked on it. The binary system was she discovered in India by Pingala, and so on. But no credit has been given even to this day. You, so if you look into Encyclopedia, uh, the textbook written by the Westerners, so no due credit is given to that. This is this shows nothing but rank prejudice. I have myself conducted a series of conferences on. <clears throat> what is known as Swadeshi Indology, where I have pointed out the the severe prejudices even to this ranking, even to this day. So, uh, in the approaches of Western Indologists and how they need a great deal of correction, and how the their prejudices enter into encyclopedias and then into our own textbooks, and therefore uh, our own people cannot believe. I I have I was shown a, a thread by my wife in the Twitter. So then somebody writing. Okay, okay. Tomorrow you will say that you will claim that even if you were accident, but are yours. Yes, it is. It indeed is. So there is ample proof today. If only one can open one's eyes and look into the research that is going on in the uh, most recent period, one can get to know the truth of that. <coughs> Now Kumar Swami was the person who single-handedly see reversed the whole thing and. held aloft the greatness and glory of our heritage and the greatness of our art and uh, the, the the last verdict like sentence of um, kumar swami it's also the last passage that i'm going to quote here no artist of today however great could more exactly or more wisely create an image of that energy which science must postulate behind all phenomena so what the science or now the scientists are now conceiving of so was the one that is proje projected and presented in this piece of art if we could reconcile if we would reconcile time with eternity we can scarcely do so otherwise than by the conceptions of alternations of phase extending over vast regions of space and great tracts of time so massive conceptions of space and time it's only india had carl sagan so in his book cosmos says that <clears throat> the one calculation that comes closest to the modern calculations of the birth and death of the the universe it's only indians only hindus have given that others have not been able to think of even something like say 8000 years ago so in, in the 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 rank prejudice among westerners to bring on the dates of all the great authors of india including the vedas to as close to our date as possible so they won't want vedas to be dated any time before see uh, 1500 bc or even 1000 bc and that is because they don't uh, because they don't biblical prejudices so and therefore <coughs> these are the and also the the political prejudices which are even more powerful there so <coughs> the 
uh, vast regions and of space and great tracts of time. It's only India that could conceive. So, in fact, in our everyday sankalpa, we say that so uh, uh, adhya brahmana ha. So, Shweta Varaha Kalpe, Vivasada Manante, Kalige, Prathame Pade, Jambudvipe, Bharata. So, what is the time scale that we are looking there? So, the, both geography-wise and history-wise, it is a massive scale. <coughs> Kumar Swami says, especially significant then is the phase alternation impl implied by the drum. Now, we have the Big Bang Theory which says that it's a, it's a sort of a pulsating theory of the universe where the universe is born and then it so from a point mass of infinite potential to an expanding universe to a contracting universe reducing itself to a point mass again itself exploding once again and to repeat this process again is what is indicated by the drum so of in the hands of Lord Shiva so this has been postulated then not after scientists discovered this is not post the statements of scientists that this interpretation has been given. So, the, the, the four hands of Shiva are bringing out what is called Panchakritya. So, Srishti, Sthiti, Laya and then uh, Anugraha and Tirodhana. So, this, this cyclicity of Srishti, Sthiti and Laya is what is indeed scientists have been speaking of as a pulsating theory of universe. So, <coughs> and uh, Kumar Swami says, these are but visual symbols of the theory of the day and night of Brahma. So, the day of Brahma and the night of Brahma are vast scales. So, and these are small specks that we find. So, Kumar Swami's last word on this is, in the fullness of time, still dancing, he destroys all forms and names by fire and gives new rest. This is poetry, but nonetheless science. Now, this very statement, this is poetry, but nonetheless science, was um, made use of by Fridge of Capra in his Tower of Physics. So, and we can find that even in later works, uh, this idea has been uh, very well expanded. And uh, in front of the CERN laboratory, we have the dancing Natarajan in New Year's. And today, uh, in, in Modi's grand program of the uh, G21 summit also we have the grand image of Nataraja being shown and the significance of uh, this great murti of Nataraja it was to Kumar Swami to bring us and open the eyes of the Westerners to the beauty and grandeur of Indian art and open the eyes of Indians themselves to the beauty and grandeur of Indian art and spirituality. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. An excellent lecture like this is possible only for a person with vast knowledge and in-depth knowledge in Sanskrit. And we thank Dr. Kandan for this excellent valedictory address. Now it is the time to honor Dr. Prof. Uh, Professor Kandan. I request our uh, Vice President, Dr. Kotresh, to handle the Next person to be honored is the GB Harish. Whenever we conduct some seminar, we need GB Harish because he listens to our time and he concises the entire topic to that uh, time frame and he does it very efficiently, effectively. Therefore, I request our Vice President Dr. Potrash.
and this today's international seminar was possible by the guidance active participation and she helped a lot in finalizing the topics as well as the speakers that is none other than dr chudamani nandagopa we from the mythic society of mythic society and ignca we thank you very much madam and then audience plays an important role in any seminar in the seminar we saw both the days actively participating audience then in the afternoon session even they have participated in the program i mentioned a few names in this dr aruni dr arch kulkarni dr gopal krishna dr minu dr meera kannan and many more scholars participated and announced the importance and the effect of the seminar mythic society and ignca extend our hearty confer this thing uh, to these scholars and then this seminar was supposed to be graced by dr sachidananda joshi member secretary of the ignca because already it is mentioned g21 and other unavoidable circumstances he could not attend but we extend our warm this thing greetings to him then this this uh, media persons have covered this program uh, we extend our warm this thing to media persons also these type of seminars are possible